أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين So we are um, now talking about the controversial discussion of polygyny So polygyny is different from polygamy which is different from polyandry. So they're all three different things. Polygamy is any of a spouse or spouses marrying more than one of the other one. Okay? Polygyny, as you see up here, is a man marrying more than one woman. Polyandry is women marrying more than one man. So you, now you see the difference. A lot of times people just use their term polygamy. But we don't have something called polygamy. And to my knowledge, there has never been in any religion or culture polygamy. But they keep using this term. So maybe we're being a little bit uh, strict on the terms. Um, so maybe somebody has an academic background and they are looking into it. So let's make sure that we know what we're talking about so that we don't give people the wrong idea based on terms. The Qur'an is uh, talking about where it describes the reality of polygyny in the third verse of Surah An-Nisa. He says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُقْسِطُوا فِي الْيَتَامَا فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَاعَ فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةً أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ ذَلِكَ أَدْنَا أَلَّا تَعُولُوا So this, is, this verse is what uh, means. If you fear you cannot be fair in the orphans. So originally the discussion of the surah was about marrying an orphan. Then... Uh, you can marry two, three, or four. If you fear you cannot be fair to them, then marry one or be with your slave women. That makes it more likely for you to avoid injustice. So what we learn from this uh, ayah or this verse of the Quran is that it has been made permissible for a man to marry up to four wives. Now somebody might think that this is like Islam is just MashaAllah engaging in some sort of a, a, super desire for women. So many of the companions, the men, at this time when the verse was revealed had married 8, 10, 15. Many examples in authentic hadith in which that verse was revealed and the Prophet wasallam, a man comes to him and says, Well I have 10 wives, what am I supposed to do? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? You have to get rid of six of them. Um, this is authentic hadith. This is, uh, that's what he said. You have to get rid of, divorce, six women. Pick four and that's because the verse is now Allah. Now somebody might say, that's not fair. You know, they've become, a, what's being said here is that it is impossible to, uh, as you'll see in this verse as we go along, to have any reasonable sort of marriage as the meaning of the term marriage with 10, 8, 7 and things like this. It's, it's, it's clearly above and beyond normalcy from per potentiality of taking care of these women. So God is narrowing it because the Arabs, they had many types of marriage. I'm going to say they had like many forms of marriage as we will see as we go along today. So the Arabs did not have a concept of monogamy and the sacred marriage. Actually, most of the world did not have this idea of monogamy. There's really only one place when this was revealed on planet Earth where this is common, and that was in Rome and Greece. The rest of the world was very comfortable with polygamy. It was a world history, we'll get to that. But what do the scholars understand from this verse? Did any scholar ever understand it is an obligation for men to marry four women? Clearly, it's saying you can marry. And the only time in which scholars said it would be um, 
advised or uh, what we call mustahab, something that would be in your better interest, it would be in the case that you have some serious desires and you have some, or say for example your first wife is not able to have children. See what I'm saying? This is common. So these things come, you would like to have children and that. And we'll see the conditions because there's conditions. It's not just as you like. There's a divine law that has wisdom here. So um, the scholars have pretty much by consensus said this verse is referring to permissibility. Meaning it is, an, it is allowed because God is saying, okay, um, O Arab people to whom this revelation is first coming to, and O world, most of you who actually have this practice. We are hereby limiting you by divine decree to the potentiality of four wives and no more. That was a limit that did not exist in the rest of the world's cultures. So, I mean, if you read the Bible... Solomon, alayhi salam, Suleiman, supposedly had a thousand wives. So that's what they believe. That's what they say. Okay? So, uh, according to all biblical scholars, Abraham had two wives at the same time. He said, Sarah and Hagar. Hmm? Some scholars said that he took a third. And they're saying... That Abraham is the foundation of prophethood. This is a Jewish and Christian belief. He's the forefather of prophets. He is after Jesus for Christians, after Moses for Jews. He is, if not on that level, he is the next holy of all people. Okay? So that's what we have in there. So, cultural familiarity with the concept, when a rule comes down with permissibility, Culture can decide ma'roof or munkar. This is an Islamic legal principle that you have to understand. If the Qur'an is not saying, yeah, that's good, you should do it. It's a, it's a praiseworthy act. If the Qur'an does not say, that's wrong. If it leaves it in what we call nitaq al-mubah, the category of permissibility, then the locality of the tendencies of the people plays a role in deciding on that matter. So it is not wrong for somebody to say as a Muslim that I know it's permissible in the religion, but culturally it's wrong. There's nothing wrong with that statement. You can say that. You are saying if it was culturally acceptable to any Muslim, then this verse would permit that for them. But for me as an American, for example, that is strange and seemingly wrong and weird. Nothing wrong with saying that. Some people get the idea that since it's in the Qur'an, then therefore it must be holy. It is not holy. It is simply God regulating a norm, as we will talk about many other issues coming up in this verse, that existed and saying, here's what you could do, human beings, if you were to follow said custom. Here's the limits, and here's the rules and the conditions by which you can approach that. You hear me? I didn't just do kufr or anything like that? Okay, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. So why is it, why is it, uh, what does it say that uh, being with a slave woman would not be injustice to the wives? What's that? Being with a slave woman would not be injustice to the wives? So, uh, right now, we're, we're, we haven't got there. There's many slides to this. Okay. Inshallah. <laughs> he said, hold on. Let's just jump to the nitty-gritty. <laughs> you heard this? Nitty-gritty. No, I'm talking about. Let's get to the issue here. We can, we've we already dealt with all that other stuff. Let's, what about the slaves here, man? So, no, I got, I got a question. So, yeah. so, when you're saying it's not holy, then, then what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Good, good. I know what Abdullah's doing. He's playing the angel's advocate. <laughs> no, no, no. What he's saying, I know Abdullah is totally on board with me. He's being very wise in making sure that someone in this room who's not on board might get the full picture of what I mean because he knows that I do not mean that. Okay. The ayah is holy divine revelation teaching people how to regulate their customs if they have this particular custom. 
So it's holy. Because it's giving you divine guidance on how to deal with it. But it is not saying that the practice itself is holy. The ayah about how to regulate it is divine guidance, which there you would be doing kufr if you said that's not holy. What we're saying is, is that it's not encouraging it and really no scholar. I mean, I even just to see, because mashallah, the Saudiya, it's very, it's known. Okay? No I don't know, no, Ibn Baz, Ibn Rasim, it's not Mubah. Amr Mubah. Yani, it's Tartib uh, Umur al Usra Bishurut. It's how it could be. And this comes up a lot in the Quran. There are many things that, in the Quran or the Sunnah, when the pro- I'll give you a great example. So, you know, some people think that anything the Prophet did or anything that was mentioned, we should teach, like, that's a holy thing, right? It's a famous story about when the Prophet ﷺ, they, they caught a lizard. They caught a lizard, and they slaughtered him. They said, well, oh, Prophet, can we eat the lizard? He said, yes, you can eat the lizard. And then they said, here, we've got the lizard all cooked up on the stick like the, out, out west. We've got some beans and a lizard. And they came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Hasrez, I don't eat lizards. <laughs> they didn't say, Astaghfirullah, we should not be eating The Prophet doesn't do. They know that this is not, it's a matter of permissibility. If you like it, fine. If you don't like it, fine. It's not a holy or not holy thing. The Prophet Wasallam is a human being with certain, you know, preferences, right? Now, of course, we have some scholars that, you know, more from the Sufi tradition. They think that every single thought, action, step about the Prophet is something holy. And I will tell you that everything that the Prophet ﷺ did that had to do with character and guidance and beliefs and all of that is holy. When it comes to human behavior as just the, ne- the Prophet ﷺ was إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I'm not making this up. It's mentioned many times in the Quran in which people challenged him as some holy resource and then in some cases people exaggerate about him. He said, I am a human being like you. Okay? So he's saying, I've been given revelation. That's what sets me aside. So when I'm talking spirituality or religion or worship or character, it becomes holy. Other than that, it's just uh, a man's personal preference. Yes, sir. I think I got what you're saying. So somebody says, I don't think this is uh, relevant anymore, it's outdated. Okay? Uh, just like we said last week about the physical reprimand mentioned about the um, potentiality for a husband to bring his wife back to her senses. It doesn't become outdated. It can be contextually cultural relevant or not. So what we know is uh, in most cases in the modern intellectual educated world if a man pokes his wife or slaps her on the shoulder she's gonna get all angry or perhaps call the police and now you have more problems than in the beginning. So are you, and that is very common nowadays. So are you saying that Allah does not have the wisdom of how to solve their problem? Or, or are we saying that culturally it was relevant at some time in which the average in that society response would have been like, Oh, you know, my husband, I feel like, you know, I've, I've gone too far. Astaghfirullah, I'm sorry about this, you know. And then she would have, now. The problem is in our modern thing, we, have, we think in extremes about certain cultural norms. No scholar in the history of Islam has ever said it is permissible for a man to harm his wife under any circumstances, and children as well. You cannot leave a mark or harm them or humiliate them or come at them in anger. If you do that, you are a criminal and abuser and you need to go to some sort of psychiatrist, psychologist and if you leave that harm and she calls the police, we're going to support the sister. Just so it's known. Because that's unacceptable according to all scholars, all schools of thought. You do not abuse your wife. Abu Hanifa, he said, if a woman comes to me, I have these bruises, my husband has beat me, and uh, someone in the home can confirm that, we'll bring in that man, and we'll find a man his size or bigger to beat him exactly as he beat her to leave the same marks. Qisas. 
Yeah, that's what he said. Because it's unacceptable. And many scholars have said, at that point, لَهَا فَسْخَ العقد. She can have the uh, annulment of the marriage contract. So that's that issue. Let's go back to our issue now. So you cannot say um, it's outdated, unusable, except for when we get to like uh, slavery. Because the Qur'an is not encouraging slavery in any way, shape, or form. It's regulating the existence of it. You see what I'm saying? So, but on this one, here's the thing. We're going to get to the point. Let's just get to the legal rights. We're going to get, the point's going to come in a moment, inshallah. So, now the issue about the first wife's approval. Technically, from a legal standpoint of Islamic law, the vast majority of scholars said it's not needed. The guy wanted to go marry a second one, then he would go marry her. He has to tell everybody, so he has to tell her. He can't hide it. Also, there's a consensus. You cannot have secret marriages. This is absolutely wrong according to all of the scholars. No secret marriage. This is zina. This is fornication, adultery. So if you went, he would marry her and then he would tell everybody. Here's, the, here's what I have learned from Sheikh Abdul Wadah Sayyid, Allah Yerhamu. He said, it all goes back to the cultural normalcy of the event. See, if it's culturally accepted, first wife probably won't have a problem with it because it's normal. Her aunts, her uncles, her mom were first, second, third wives. This has happened before. This is not like something strange and out of the ordinary. One of the things in dealing with all of this is to not, ex not, to not deify or make sacred the inclinations of people's cultures. That is not sacred. Just because people think in a certain way, here in America, for example, today, does not make that holy. You see some Muslims ready and willing to just throw away their religion and the ayahs and the hadiths behind it because people have decided in modern day America that that is uh, wrong. But they're not prophets, they did not receive revelations, and they keep changing their mind anyways. They had one idea 50 years ago, and then they changed it 20 years ago, and now they've gone back to the 50 years ago. Society keeps going, whichever is popular, the trends, and so forth. You see it. All the time it happens. So we cannot take society's inclination as some holy, above reproach basis. So we have to go to what the pro so that's what goes back to foundations. A Muslim is not just, well, I was born into this religion and I have my own intellect. And people, see, you will think that your intellect is why you think what you think. It is called sociological conditioning. Environmental conditioning is why you think the way you think. The reason why someone in Saudi Arabia thinks that um, uh, marrying polygamy is normal is because that's what everybody thinks around them. For, you know, somebody here to think it's wrong because that's what everybody thinks. So those are two opinions of culture. Fine. What did Islam say? If Islam said wrong, then one's wrong, one's right. If Islam said right, then it's right. If Islam said right, on conditions, our case right here, then we're going to stick with whatever that has said, and the cultures can have their opinions. So that's, uh, that's, that's how we do So we don't say um, the verse is invalid under any circumstances, because it's divine revelation. That is disbelief to say, I don't accept this verse, it's out of date. See, like, um, the verse may have relevance or masalah and mafasid, benefit and harm based upon it, based upon context of how it's applied. That's a scholarly discussion. And we have scholars that have rulings and positions on this. So now, if you live in a society where it's not normal, and you just, mashallah, want to take a second wife. Now here's another ask a question. Can you take a second wife because you met some lady at work, some sister at work, or all that, and then you start talking to her, warming up? Is that acceptable? It's absolutely haram. It would come through some sort of legitimate means, through family, or say, for example, there was a lady at work, and you've had completely normal interaction. You've never been alone. You've never been sweet-talking her. You just thought, maybe I will marry this woman. Where would you go? We go to her dad, brother or uncle, and you'll talk to them before you talk anything sweet to her. This is pure Islamic teachings on how you go about that. But yet, most of the cases why the brother fell into the I need the second wife, because he fell in love with some lady at work. <laughs> some people are like, I heard a story about that. 
You see what I'm saying? And that's haram. Yeah. 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 So is there an exception that you can make them secretly, except if you have uh, like something important or something uh, like righteous to say? I don't think that's the understanding of the ayah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we could talk, you know, we probably should get through uh, this one, inshallah. So, um, so yeah, look at this. Al-Shari'a ja'at bi tahsil al-masalih wa dar al-mafasid. Because more many people, let's just say it all, let's say it in English. Okay, let's say it together. Islam, by law, has come to promote individual and social welfare and to avert or remove individual and social harm or corruption. This is, this is it. Like this is every scholar agreed about Sharia. That's what it's there for. So if you know, without a doubt, if I marry the second one, my first one's going to hate my guts and want to divorce me. Does it make any sense to marry the second one unless you very much intend to divorce the first one? You see what I'm saying? You do you see what I'm saying? That's Sheikh Abdullah Allah Hamu. That's how he's making it clear. He's like, what it was was that was normal. That's why the scholars all said, you know, no need for ikhbar. And he, he's the you know man of the household. He's gonna decide what he's gonna do for his family. Uh, marrying a second or third or fourth wife is something normal in their culture. It's not some crazy thing out of the ordinary. Actually, some sisters be like, man, I get a free night every, every week. I get free, free nights every other night from this guy. Yeah, you should see. I, one time. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're almost there. So what are the conditions? Now we get to the point. Is it just generally allowed that the man decides this is what I'm going to do? No, there's a conditions. The first condition is, uh, it's the, the overarching condition is called justice. Fair equality between spouses. So if I have two wives or three wives or four wives, they have to get the same amount of time. So it's been mentioned in clear hadith. If he married another wife, every other night he will stay with that wife in her house. Which, as you see the implied they have to have two separate houses. And it is their right to have the exact same size house unless there's kids living in it. This one has enough for those. This one has enough for those. And then they have to have the same clothing. Have to have the same clothing. And food and all of that. And here's where the thing comes here in America. The reason why it's actually haram for marrying another one here, Islamic law wise, because the second one will not have her rights in a court of law. Under any circumstances, will that second wife have any rights? Even if the first wife write off all her rights to her? I mean, even if you write off the... the You're suggesting that the first wife divorce her husband so that the second wife can marry legally, so that the second wife can have all the rights? On what planet is that going to happen? No, no, it doesn't... Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's not just inheritance. There's all kinds of things. What about uh, divorce and all those things? What about how that goes? So, um, the full legal rights will only be in this country for one wife and never a second. So, we'll get to... Um, Why is it not going to the next one? <laughs> Okay, we're going to get to the, the next, that point again. So, the law is making it prohibited now because the second one does not have any rights in the court of law. And there's only one place, and this is, I'm, we don't want to go too far into the whole divorce thing. Muslims are all confused about how divorce works in America. And they live in some fantasy land, and they act like, and they go to imams, and imams from overseas start saying stuff that means nothing it means nothing, they have no control, no authority at all, it's not your business to formulate a divorce or what have you. 
That's going to happen where? Sheikh Faisal Mawlawi, Allah Yarhamu, one of the great scholars of our day, he passed away a few years ago. MashaAllah, he, uh, he was the chief of the Sunni courts of Lebanon, of Beirut. And uh, he, used, he went over to Morocco and he was a scholar there. And he was on the Fiqh Council of America and Europe. Sheikh Faisal Mawlawi said, after researching this whole issue thoroughly, there is tawkil al-aqad ala kulli hal. Fi in'iqad al-aqad fi amrika. What will happen is, when you marry, according to Islamic law, there is no, we go marry at a court and now we're married in Islam. No, that's a court. There has to be shurut, that you have the wali, and you have the shahidan, and all of these, those have to be there, okay? So you can't go to the court and get the law. But once you do the Islamic, and at the same time, you do the legal, then that marriage contract is in a court. The only one who can do anything with that contract is a court of law here. So Muslims get into this, you know, power play. We have our sharia. And those are kuffar. So we'll do what we want to do. And then they, they, they play around with it. Poor sister lives in misery. The guy doesn't even, you know, care about her at all. The culture has deemed a very weak hadith as authentic. Uh... Akrah um, Mubah and Allah al Talaq. This is not an authentic hadith. No scholar said such a thing. This hadith is not a basis for Islamic law. Abghal. Uh, so, uh, the most disliked halal. Metanan gharib jiddan. Ghar makhbul. It doesn't make sense as a text. The most disliked permissible in, with Allah. So what is his most liked impermissible? Both of those don't make any sense by a text. So Sanadan wa Matnan, hadith marfud. But Urfan, it is the most authentic hadith that exists by culture. La, there can never be divorce. Sister, you must be patient. Poor sister has gone mad and is abused because of this nonsense. So, um, so basically, um, what you do is you get an advice spiritually. And then, natwakkal ala Allah. So a sister comes to me, she's like, this is what happened, that's how I go talk to the brother, we sit together and we say, okay, here's, what, here's my advice. She said, well, you know, he's saying no matter what, because he's Muslim, and, um, you know, he can do whatever he wants, and he's the man, and so his opinion is this and that. You got some sick brothers talking like this. And then, so, I have to stay with him. And I said, sister, if you believe you're oppressed, and that's not my, I don't know. That's you know it. If I, I'm not telling you, are you oppressed? I'm not witnessing it. I'm hearing about it. Okay? If you're oppressed, you're being beat, abused, emotionally, verbally, and that's your reality, go to the court and divorce this dude. And I don't have no, I can't do it. Many other imams you will talk to will say, look at this Americanized. He's destroying marriages. What they're doing is, they are uh, um, perpetuating miserable, abusive marriages by a false hadith. This is what's really going on. So, we, we had a... a no. The ayah says, when khiftum first. Yeah. So does that mean that one of the, like, the first reasons to have multiple marriages is just to take care of the orphans? Or is it somehow related to that? Yeah. Or isn't that some kind of giving the people the reason for, for, for doing this? I'm going to be dead honest with you. The long uh, tafsir on this is about muhur and nafaqa and you know the feeling of well you know she's yatama and so now how will I treat her and so it's, it's, it's some long drawn out thing that I think if we just stick to the, the subject matter, which is the consensus. There is no debate. There's no difference of opinion. This verse is for uh, marrying more than one wife for anyone. Orphan or non-orphan, like that. That's what they understood. So now love is another thing. You cannot say... So some people say, Oh, well, you know, I don't have to be equal because it says, وَلَن تَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ لَن تَسْتَطِيعُوا أَن تَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ uh, so, 
So, <coughs> this, uh, this ayah is talking about love. You cannot love your wives the same. Love is something abstract. It's not something you can control it. Why did that happen? Because everybody knew that the Prophet ﷺ loved Aisha more than everybody else. And Aisha did not like that it seemed the Prophet ﷺ loved Khadija before her more than everyone else. No, no, there's some serious hadith that if I say them, you'll think I'm some bad person. But these are authentic hadith. I'm not going to say them because people don't like to hear those hadith. But the Sahaba were human beings. It's another news flash. Let's keep, make sure we know this. So you don't lose your religion when you read a crazy hadith that you thought it could never happen that they said this. It's just people. So that's the ayah. Now look at this. In official Orthodox Judaism, in their own book, it is documented that all the way up to the 10th century common era, 11th century common area era, that some big well-respected Rabbi Gershom, Ben Yehuda, he said, I'm making a decree that the law of Judaism is changing and now it must be monogamous. All marriages must be monogamous. And he was such a great scholar that all the scholars other than him, they followed this. So what we know is, for 5,000 years, what we know from their history, what they say is like their calendar and all that, they're like in 6,000 something right now. So 1,000 years ago, you know, 5,000 years, they were saying, Polygamy is acceptable and normal. Rabbi Gershom has changed that. In 1531, the Anabaptists openly preached at Munster that who wants to be a true Christian must have several wives. We know the Mormons say that this is a holy thing. So for Mormons, it's holy. You're not a real good Mormon man unless you marry many. And the more you marry, the more holy you are. This is the Christian religion of America. I'll give you some feedback. Um, there's a guy named Joseph Smith who the uh, people who learned from him uh, took him as the prophet mentioned in the New Testament of the Holy Bible that the Jews came to Jesus, peace be upon him or John the Baptist, peace be upon him and they're asking him, are you the Messiah? I'm not the Messiah. So are you Elijah? I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? I'm not the prophet. So we all know who the prophet is. Okay, but Christians have always been confused. Those that read the verse and think, well, who is that? They solved it in the 1800s in America. A man named Joseph Smith, I'm him. He said, I'm getting revelations on golden tablets in a heavenly language. This is their belief. Golden tablets came down in some language from heaven. God inspired him to know that language. And then he translated it to English. And then he, the one narration, the tablets vanished into heaven, they floated up to heaven, another one he buried them. But we don't know where these golden tablets are. This is the only miracle we know. So I try to tell Muslims, don't tell people it, that the Prophet performed a miracle by Isra' al-Mi'raj. Is Isra' al-Mi'raj a miracle in terms of what we understand to be proof of Nubuwa? It is not, nobody saw it. No people saw that happen, so it's not a miracle in terms of what is a proof of prophethood. You don't say to the non-Muslim, our prophet did a miracle that will blow your mind. He went up. Who saw that? Nobody did. You would just make yourself look very silly. It happened, we know, and it is miraculous beyond the laws of nature. So for him, it is a miracle that God blessed him with. For us, it is what we know from the scripture happened to him. Right? But as far as Joseph Smith's concerned, I don't know of any miracles he was performing other than the story about the golden tablets. So once again, since nobody seems to know about it, saw that, it's just a story. For them, it makes, they want to believe in it. So Mormons, big deal. So, Mormons in America all went to Utah. And so, did they come up with my Bank of America? Oh, no, it's up here. <laughs> Some notice coming up. Um, Mormons... We all went to Utah. They, they were actually from Georgia, Maryland, this uh, Virginia, Maryland, this area over here. They all went to Utah because it was uninhabited. It was a desert land. The Mormons all went, let's work together as a commune. Let's build all of my wives, they'll have all my children. Average Mormon has like 15, 20 kids. So they go over there and they formed Utah. Allahu Akbar, man, Mormons are amazing people. They have absolute control over the state of Utah, if you know this. Yeah. All of the 
basically they, I think they are like 70% of the population, 60%, something like that. Yeah, they're a very strong group over there. They had some edict that happened in the mid-1900s that the federal was clamping down on them. You guys have all this stuff. So one of their top elder priests said, we're abrogating the thing in our scripture that says it's a holy thing that a real man would only... He has to marry all these women. So then, many groups split off. And he said, you guys are sellouts. You guys have sold yourself to the secular American rules. And what about the First Amendment? We should have the right to marry the many women we want because we all believe that's permissible by religion. Some Muslims say, and I don't see any problem with this. <laughs> People say, well, you know, now you see all of the gay rights and all of that. What if Muslims start to campaign for the rights for this? I don't know how many Muslims actually are trying to do this. Other than just like, you know, for the right of it. But I don't see it as like something so prioritized where everybody's like, just, I have, this is this woman, I gotta marry her. And I, you know, I have to marry her, you know. So I don't see it as a big priority. But it is happening amongst Americans, that you know. This is actually becoming a big deal. Uh, Lisa Ling, you have to watch her thing about the CNN thing she did about the Muslims in America. So you will learn about the real original Muslims of America and who they are today is the Imam Mordin Muhammad's community. Um, and there's some amazing stories in there. But then she did one on this thing. And it wasn't about religion. She did a thing on polygamy and polyandry. She found people all over the websites, people all over the country, they're living as second... Uh, wives and all that, they live together, everything. They, like, the, he, they did a whole interview online in Texas. These are millennials. Guys in his early 30s. And he's got two wives, they live with him at the house. And they love each other. Everything's fine. It's not like some sick deal. No, those two women are not having anything to do with each other. They just like him. And some people get the wrong idea altogether. And they're just saying, we're like sisters, like in, like for example, when I was in Kuwait, I met this really beautiful Filipino brother from Philippines. He is the head da'i for the Filipino Department of Islam Presentation Committee, Sheikh Abdul Hadi. Amazing guy, one of the amazing people. And so I was praising him to another brother, my brother Sameh. It's like, mashallah, that brother is such an amazing guy. He was like, I don't know how he does it. I was like, he's following Islam, mashallah, he's Sheikh. And he says, no, but brother, he has four wives. So he's assuming that somebody should just have no way to live their life and be happy if he has four wives. So I was like, okay, what? No way. I've never even heard about this. You know, in the first place, I've never heard of a Filipino marrying another one. So I went over and I went, I said, brother, I said, are you married to four women? He's like, who told you? <laughs> and I was like, he's like, so he said, yeah, alhamdulillah, mashallah. And I was like, how do you do that? He's like, well, we have four apartments on top of each other in the same building. So every day I'm with one of the other ones. And I was like, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're all in the same row. This one goes above that one. And they're all in the same apartment building. Everybody has their own apartment. So he said, I said, how do you do that? He says, my first wife is a Kharij al Kulit Sharia too. And she believes that righteous men and women should do this and raise lots of good Muslim kids. This is her, she's believing this. So she actually went out and got two, three, and four for me. I didn't even look, I, I didn't have nothing to do with it. She just bought, what do you think about her? And I was like, mashallah, she's all right. <laughs> Brother married all four of them. She's crazy. How many, mashallah. <laughs> How many kids you got? I got like 12, 13. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go review the thing. <laughs> Does he know all their names? <laughs> you know the Al-Saud. Man, these people have hundreds of kids. Some of the al have have hundreds. They, have, they could not tell you who their kids are. So, yeah. So same thing. You know, you have like Hindu, they have it. Krishna, Hare Krishna. They're saying this is God incarnate. Like Hindus believe this guy is like Jesus for them. He had many wives. That's their tradition. So that's their business. Okay. So they have it in America, as we said. Now we get to the Misyaf. 
Someone brothers looking at me. <laughs> so the misyar is actually a permissible marriage according to two schools of thought, and two schools of thought said no, and that's because of the concept of tanazul an al So here's what you have. What is a misyar? Misyar is guys married. Some sister, she's been married. Usually, the the normal thing. She was married and divorced, and probably most of the time she has a kid or two or three. And so she's having a hard time finding a man to marry and to spend her life with because she's husband has died or got divorced or whatever. So she's like lonely in her life and she realizes that it's unrealistic because she's tried for two, three years or whatever. She can't find anybody who wants to marry her because of whatever reason, cultural or whatever. So then this guy, you know, comes to know about her and then, you know, t goes through the right channels and says, you know, I mean, I'll marry you but you, I can't give you half of everything, I can't, I mean, I will come maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, or we'll hang out for a day, and, uh, you know, I'll give you some money, but, you know, I can't, you know, give you a house just like that, I mean, if you work, that's great, mashallah, you know, and so they do that, it's all over the Muslim Khalij in Africa, it's very common, and they're happy with it, no, these women are looking for that, okay, that's their culture, they're accepting that, so the Hanbali and the Shafi school of thought said, المسلمون عند شروطهم The Muslims are according to their conditions. This is the Prophet said that any contract, you say, here's the contract, like it happens. Sometime the sister, mashallah, is very well off, and the brother is not so well off. And they, for whatever reason, they've come to, they feel like everything's compatible except for what she's used to as a lifestyle, he cannot provide that for her. So at the marriage contract, they agree as a condition that she's going to pay for the bills, some of them. And so that does not make her the boss in Islamic law. That makes her conceding or renouncing her right to having all the things paid for. Hanafi and the Maliki said, no. Either you do all of the conditions, this is marriage, it's not like other contracts. Other contracts for buying and selling is different. The Hanabila said, no, it's a contract, it's a contract. It's, it's what it is. You're making a contract about a relationship and there's things that go to that. So that's those things. Now we know that muta is pretty much by consensus haram because of the clear hadith. We don't need a consensus because the hadith said that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited muta, yawm al khaybah. It's in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the narrator of this hadith. That's what I, I don't get it till now. How many of you know what it is? Say, I don't, raise your hand if you don't know what is muta. Everybody knows what muta is? If you don't okay. know. Okay, yeah, yeah. You don't know it, okay. <laughs> there you go. So muta is an Arab culture that is one of the forms of marriage of many. And they had some pretty crazy ones. We're not going to go into them because they get really sick and weird. But they used to have one of them, which was the temporary marriage. Basically what it was, basically it's prostitution, they're calling it marriage. That's basically, it's a form of prostitution, really. The, the Arabs before the Prophet ﷺ received revelation, it was common, particularly for travelers and people who, uh, you know, have businesses on different parts of the town, things like this. The guy would tell a woman, I'll marry you for a few days or a month or a year, and then they'll sit it. At the contract, this marriage is for this long. And once that time is over, then the marriage is annulled. The marriage's contract is over. There's no more marriage anymore. So for uh, the Prophet ﷺ allowed this for some time, and then in like the seventh year of Hijrah, he said this is no longer allowed in Islam and is prohibited from this day forward. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib has narrated this hadith, and the hadith has so many different and it has even other narrations after that at other times when people asked about it. When he went to Mecca, he affirmed this again to people in Mecca who are not, are not accustomed to this. Uh, so, there is a strange opinion of Ibn Abbas. When I say strange, in Islamic law, there is actually a term called Ra'i Shadh. So this means like an opinion that may come from a respected scholar, but all their scholars are very, very strictly against this Opinion. So Ibn Abbas and Ibn Al-Qayyim al jawziyyah there is some uh, reference where they said, it is better than zina, so fi halat al-durura. 
they're bringing in the condition of necessity. And I think this is overplaying men's desires here. I don't see the necessity where either, you know, like, basically they're, they're thinking like, you're going to fall into zina if you don't do this. So you have to make this contract. You have to do the prostitution, basically. That's what it is. So look, it looks like we're about to do zina, so let me just pay you right now a dowry, and then we'll be married for tonight, and then it's over. Now it's halal. That's what they're saying. All the ulama said, this is tala'u bid-deen. This is some strange thing. This is not burura, this is some weird, why would you even be in that thing? So all the scars like that. So, so yeah. why, uh, is there any reference to why the Rasulullah uh, promised uh, because Muslims at the beginning they were doing a lot of traveling and they were doing and then they you know they would go on the saraya and they would go on the you know trips and things and they would go from here to there things like that would go on and so uh, so there really was I mean it was something normal for them and that's another thing a lot of people get having a hard time with this well we've decided that that's wrong and I agree it's wrong it's prostitution it's not, it doesn't make any sense, it's not marriage. But, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Holy Qur'an allowed the Muslims to drink alcohol for uh, 16 years. Muslims were buying and selling and drinking alcohol every day for 16 years during the Prophethood's revelation. It was prohibited finally in the third year or the fourth year of Hijrah. And so, what that, we call it a tadarruj fit tashriya. It is helping people to learn with some lessons. So if you look, over all this time, the idea of ihsan, and chastity, and preservation of these type of desires, and seeing them at the way they probably should be seen, and promoting marriage as it is, and prohibiting wrong kinds of marriages. That was all happening throughout the seerah. So, um, God's divine wisdom, that it was at that time that it became prohibited. Unfortunately, the Shia have made this a pillar of religion. You have to know, if you ever meet Shia, unless they're doing taqiyya, which is a very big deal in their religion, they'll hide it. Say, oh, I don't even believe in that. What are you talking about? So, and that's why they're still here. If they would have ever just always said exactly what they believe, a long, long time ago they would have been done for. Um, but that's, you know, they say whatever they feel will get them. But I lived in Dearborn, Michigan, and I had a guy trying to reel me in at the laundromat. Oh, yeah. So I'm at the laundromat, you know, washing my clothes. Brother comes up next to me. He's like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, you're a convert? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, where you come from? I come from Oklahoma. Oh, I'm here studying Islam. Oh, really? Mashallah, I didn't hear about that. Oh, yes, in Southfield. Oh, okay. He's like, so are you married? And I was like, well, I'm still just getting my studies together and all that, man. And he was like, well, you should just at least marry. And I was like, you know, you can marry for this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do was telling me. He said, Imam Ilahi has a whole list of pious women. Oh. This is... His name is Imam Ilahi. He's in Dearborn, Michigan. Still there. I don't know how he hadn't been arrested. My man, you know, is like pimping out women. <laughs> Literally, that's what we call it. I know it seems offensive, but that's what it is. I mean, and so and he, pious women and women. And you'll find the ones that want to do it, like they wear hijab and they don't wear makeup and they're like, you know, they see. They in the. I read. I went to their bookstore and I read all kinds of things in the English translations. And I'm not going to go into all that. It's like a whole thing about Shia. But bottom line is. It is a fact that in Shia religion, it is seen as a noble way to preserve your chastity to have to do muta a lot, male or female. There is a difference of opinion. Does the virgin need a wali? Majority said in Ithna Sharia, she needs a wali. Yeah, so it's strange. Secret marriage, we've talked about it, it's haram. Now, the whole issue is but uh, Munir. He has come up with the thing here. He said, what is the thing about the, the slaves? So, um, this ayah and many ayahs in the Qur'an have affirmed that if a woman is your slave and she lives in your home, that if you have desires amongst you, you may be with her and this does not require a marriage. It's not marriage. This is you having intercourse with mutual agreement with your property. That's what it is. 
So there is nowhere in the Quran or the Sunnah in any way, shape, or form in which Allah or the Prophet ﷺ have said, and here's you should go buy slaves. Never. Never does it say go buy slaves. It talks about and confirms and allows the culture of if there is a war and there's some women left back. Those will be taken as slaves. Which was the culture of the world, by the way. Romans and Greeks, Christians, Jews, they all did it. It's in the Bible. The Bible has a verse that says, and when you defeat the, so, the whatever Philistines or whatever it is, then destroy them all and leave nothing that breathes except take the virgin women for yourself. That's in, the, that's in the Old Testament of the Bible today. As we have it, they have it in every church. That's what it says. So it's not something like, oh, Muslims have this crazy religion they came up with. Right? It's already there. So, um, if you look at the laws of the Qur'an, it's eradicating slavery. Whoever did such and such sin in many places, then you have to free a slave. Free a slave. The Quran uh, talks about the great uh, So it says, the human being was given intellect, expression, eyes and ears. They know the difference between right and wrong. But the human has not begun that path, that getting, surmounting that mountain of spirituality. Getting over the hurdle of spiritual dedication. So then it says, and what will let you know? How could you be, uh, how could you know what is this hurdle of spirituality? Then he says, free the slaves. First thing, فَكُّرَقَوَى Free the slave. Saying, this is a primary priority of noble spirituality. Get rid of slaves. No more slaves. The Qur'an has a concept called Mukataba. It was known to no other society in the history of mankind. If a slave starts developing their skill set, and they start to be able to um, do services for people, or sell something that they have made on their own time, then they can make, earn money. And then the zakat says, riqab, that if they come and they have uh, 10 dinars, and they were bought for 12 dinars, but they want to buy back their freedom, the zakat will say, and here you are. Two more dinars, you're free. Then the guy has to go buy something else or do whatever it is. And in Islam, you're not supposed to be buying slave. It's not. So the idea of Islam going along with the idea of buying slaves is nowhere. Now, did Muslims do it? Yes. Did African Muslims do it? Yes. Is that sick and disgusting? Of course. Just because Muslims were doing it doesn't make it right. Till now. It's not. So, yeah. so you said the concept of slavery is not in the Quran. No, 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 I did not say that. Okay, so buying slaves. slaves. Be very careful on this. Yeah, yeah. Is buying slaves in Islam is, is not is prohibited, is it? It was never encouraged, so some scholars would say it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that Islam was allowing. But Islam never said it's, it's, it should not do it. No. Islam said you need to free all these slaves, and when you do these sins, you get rid of it, and then if this person wants to buy back their freedom, they can buy it back. Here's the thing about this thing we're talking about. If a man was with his female slave, Sariya, and then she got pregnant, she becomes Umm Walad. She becomes like his wife. And then the child is free. Nobody's doubting that. The child is free. She cannot marry anyone else. And then when he dies, she's free. This is, somebody looks at it as a bad thing, this is actually one means to stop it. If she can't marry another slave in which they have another slave child, then what it's going to do is cut off the means of slavery. You see? So there's actually so a benefit. She can't marry any other slave? She can't marry anyone. Anyone. When she has, when she becomes pregnant with a free, with her master's child. Oh, okay. When she becomes pregnant with her master's child, she's Umm Walid. Okay. Is there a wife for him? It, it's not Aqdan, but Orfan. Okay. Yeah. It's everybody knows that's Umm Waladi. You know, this my is... Question, my question was about, uh, about, you know, 
the, the it's permissibly for two, three, or four wives, right? Yeah. Isn't this like a loophole uh, for some people? Because you know, if you be with your with a slave, the slave woman, mm -hmm. isn't that unjust to your wife, to your, your existing wives? No, it is not. Why not? Well, first of all, we have to go back to this, the thing about the cultural lens and what is normal. Let's re redo this one more time. Because we are taught by people who are not prophets, who did not receive a revelation as to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And if we said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that's the basis by which we define spiritually and morally what is acceptable, right? So here's the thing. The only reason, according to our shara, why a man would generally have a female slave is if there was a war and he took her in. Okay? So now she's his property. She's not a, a free woman. She's actually his property. And so, if, now so here's the issue. Rape is categorically forbidden. There's no question about that. Even if a man... He's telling his wife, I want this, and the Qur'an and the Sunnah are crystal clear that a woman should always respond at the call to her husband because this is preserving their marriage and women generally tend to not understand what kind of desires we have and how sometimes it just has to be taken care of, right? So she just has to like accept that the Qur'an and Sunnah emphasize this point for a reason that maybe she's not privy to and just give up her desire. But say, for whatever reason, she was disobedient, which is a sin, okay? But he cannot like grab her and throw her down. That's haram. His wife, his free wife. See what I'm saying? Because that's i'tida'. Wallahu la yuhibbul mu'tadeen. That's dhulm. Wallahu la yuhibbul dhalimeen. This is uh, abuse and attack. It is oppression. There is no way you can do that under any circumstance. Wife or slave. So the non-Muslim argument is, Islam is saying you can rape your slave women. Because the understanding is, why would anybody want to be a slave or accept being a slave? Of course you think that way in the year 2017 in America, but Thomas Jefferson's slave women were probably all really excited to probably be with him because they looked up to him as this amazing figure and this man who's like the master. The way their psychology was was very different. The way they looked at it because of the norm. Objectivity is one of the hardest things to come by. So many Muslims are culturally controlled and your thought process is culturally defined. What people in my society I grew up in, what I learned from the people I know has decided what is right and what is wrong. Back then, it would have been normal for her to look up to. This is where the problem comes when we talk about people using power. So say for example in a classroom, the teacher do you know how many young girls in a classroom look up to the teacher and he's all oh, this man and he's teaching us and you know all of that and then if he talks to her in a certain way she might start thinking about him so he would be abusing her using his authority or influence as that guy to go along with that because she is not there's no way that that's allowed same thing you hear about it in religious scenarios priest, imam, whatever, this guy has some girl coming to him trying to get her emotional thing. That's why it should never be that you allow a woman with emotional issues to come to you and have some private conversation. In Islam, you can't even be alone. But even what I'm saying, say for example, the door is open right here. And there's some people talking in here. Technically, any sister wants to come in, we sit there and talk, it's no problem, sharia-wise. But if she starts coming in there crying, I should ask her to bring somebody else or say, you know... Maybe you should talk to someone else or something like this because this became, it creates a scenario in which advantage and shaitan and all that can get into it, right? Now in the case that that is your property, now we can't get that because of the cultural lens. How could you ever be property? We don't get it. But if you step back and say, okay, I don't get it because of my culture and I, don't, I would never condone it or accept it as an uh, acceptable practice. But say I lived in a time and place and it was, that woman, how she thought, okay, would have made that a normal relationship. Boy, Jonathan Brown at Georgetown, he made this and man, the whole anti-Islam thing came after him like nothing else. We'll, we'll edit the tape. <laughs> man, they, they, they weren't accepting it. 
the bottom line is here, we're not saying you should do that or slavery should come back or slavery is acceptable. We're saying in the terms in which God revealed messages regulating it, she lives in your house. It would be very normal for you to have feelings. It would be very strange legally to say this one cannot interact with his property who has a desire for him and then it would be zina if they came together. You see that? She lives in his house. She's not required to wear hijab or be away from him. There's nothing wrong with being alone with his own property and his own house. You see what I'm saying? It's hard for you to understand this, but when you get it as an, as an abstract, as an objectified outside in looking in, you will see why it would, it would be a zulm to say it's zina if he ended up being with her. Because that's putting them in a situation where they're probably going to have that, and probably that's how it was the norm. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's a tough one to give, but, it, it, yeah. Slavery in Islam is not defined by color. Just no, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. Slavery has nothing to do with the color of skin. So, but they, you know, unfortunately that's, the sickness of the world is that white supremacy is a worldwide problem, and white people always deem themselves. But, to be honest, let's be dead honest with ourselves, it was black men from Africa doing most of the sale, sales of the black slaves. They were the, they were the ones making a lot of money out of this. So it was a big disaster. As we said, she becomes, uh, the child becomes free, and she's like his wife uh, when he dies. Back so she carries a child, child is growing up, the guy dies. She becomes a free woman, she can marry whoever she wants, she's free, she can go work. That's, that's basically that. So, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think you still got something different. You know, the, what are the signs? Of oh, yeah, that's Yom Al-Qiyamah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's what's neat. No, 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 yeah, yeah, no, so the scholars looked at that. They said that what this is mean is like the children start to take a play a role in Amma here, Amatullah. You know, like, La tamna'u ima Allah min al-masajid, yani al-nisa. So basically it's saying, you know, so yati zaman, أن أولاد النسوان سوف يتحكمون أو يعني يصورون من أنفسهم أنهم هم ال هم الأولياء لل للأمهات. مثل الآن مثل الآن يعني the the kids you know you see. Oh yeah. Islam is what slave. Yeah yeah. No we had it in our history. What he's talking about is there. So like sometimes when we had the Mamluk in Egypt, the the king. Yeah yeah yeah. 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 In Egypt, the, the kings, they were children of slaves. And so, originally their family was slaves, they became the kings of a kingdom. And that's something peculiar to our history, by the way. Because of our system, and that, like we said, that's a way of ending slavery, and bringing somebody up to that status. So some people look at that as, oh, as look, he's with his wife. Actually, if he's with her, she gets pregnant, that will be a means to blocking slavery. So a lot of people aren't even looking at it that way. You know, they're not seeing that this is actually a way to remove slavery. Uh, the inheritance there, um, the child obviously is going to inherit. There's a difference of opinion. Does the woman inherit? Some saying, yeah, because she is uh, like they're saying, shibhi, um, uh, um, waladi, shibhi, zawja. Yeah. 